This episode of Dopey is brought to you by our friends at Aloe Recovery. Located in sunny Southern California, in Malibu and Silver Lake, Aloe was created by our friend Bob Forrest and his friends Evan and Jared and Bob. Aloe was created as a place to treat addicts with compassion and not control. They have a staff with decades of experience treating addiction and co-occurring mental health disorders. Aloe offers a very, very comfortable detox, which is crucial if you're trying to kick heroin or benzos or alcohol. They have amazing amenities. They have equine therapy, which is some sort of horsing sort of care. They have sound bath meditation. They have surfing. They have sweat lodges. It is an incredibly nurturing and comfortable environment. If you're fucked and you don't know where else to go and you're willing to go to sunny Southern California, I totally, totally, totally recommend Aloe. This episode of Dopey is also brought to you by our favorite dating app, Clean and Sober Love, also known as CASL. It is the dating app for people who choose a sober way of life. It was created by one addict to help another addict to date safely. So here's the deal. You got clean, you got sober, you got a new life, and now you're ready to date. So where are you supposed to look? Fucking Backpage Magazine? CASL is the solution. That's CASL. Dating and recovery is real and worth considering if your shit is together. CASL is the platform where you can meet like-minded people all over the world. Install the app now on the App Store or Google Play Store. Oh, and by the way, it's totally fucking free. If you're going on this site, tell your friends to go on it. Populate this site with the best-looking addicts and alcoholics you can find. And enjoy finding love. Finding sex, finding each other in a clean and sober, loving way. This episode of Dopey is also brought to you by you guys in the Dopey Nation through the Dopey Patreon page. It's www.patreon.com slash Dopey Podcast. And I know what you think, that the Patreon page is a, just a, an easy way for me to beg money off you guys, which is true. But what you don't know is if you go on the Patreon page, you're going to find oodles and oodles of free Dopey stuff, which is just free. So if you don't want to give money, don't give money. But go to the Patreon page, which is www.patreon.com slash dopeypodcast to, to get all the free extra bonus dopey stuff. Also, I don't know if you know this, but I have a ton of fucking dopey beanies that are beautiful, and I'm selling them. I also have the amazing first-run dopey socks with Big Bird on them. Uh, I also have amazing Dopey stickers. If you want any of that stuff, you just Venmo me at Dopey Podcast. We have ridiculously nice clothing at uh, DopeyPodcast.com. We have T-shirts. We have long sleeves. We have hoodies. And we have the new exclusive long sleeve white uh, Dopey shirt with the exclusive Lee Trice art on the back. I ordered one, and it actually looks good. So check it out, www.DopeyPodcast.com. Enough with the ads. Here's the fucking show. Hello and welcome to Dopey, the podcast about drugs, addiction, and dumb shit. That's for sure. I'm Dave and I've made a terrible mistake you're of sure. giving giving my father his own microphone. This is something I never do. <laughs> it's awful. Welcome back to the show. It's too early in the morning for you to be here. I get to my dad's apartment this morning. He tells me he's awake which normally he's asleep when I get here, and he comes out of the back fully dressed with a concerned look on his face. What is the concern, you might ask? $1,300. No, the concern? What? Ringworm. Oh. My dad is convinced he has ringworm. And that was a terrible episode when she was talking about that. Who? Uh, uh, Dresner? Uh, Amy Dresner. Right? Is that correct? Yeah. Did she have ringworm? I don't know. I don't remember. It scared me. <laughs> so you have, my dad has some sort of mark on his elbow and he's concerned. Well, anyway, well, I was more concerned about $1,300. That was kind of ridiculous. Oh, yeah. That's the other story. The other story of the moment is uh, I got a bill yesterday from um, some sort of company telling me that I owe them $1,300 to trademark the alt recovery movement. Yeah, major error. Well, it turns out that I, 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 listen, there's been moments in the past where I've called my father 
destitute, fucked, sick, broken, and said, I'm an, I have a big problem. And that's exactly what you said last and night. And last night, I called my father and I said, I have a big problem. Correct. So this is progress. Um, progress. So he says that he, he owes $1,300 for this ridiculous alt-recovery stuff. Well, the alt-recovery movement is the skeleton key that will solve any addiction problem. Well, all right. I, I hope it's successful. So for you, to, for you to poo-poo this idea, and it turns out I don't owe the $1,300. That's the, uh, yeah, that's the he, truth. David forgot to read the fine print on the bottom of the, of the letter, and the fine print said uh, that is, if you haven't paid us now, and uh, you don't have to pay us unless you want us to do this, which of course he doesn't. It, it, what? You, you don't want this company to do it. You want the official United States government patent office to do it, Correct. which is your legal authority is trying to do it. Well, I want the, the crack dopey legal team to be handling this thing. <laughs> yeah, well, the crack dopey legal team is about to quit. That's what's happening. The ringworm is going <laughs> to sideline my crack dopey legal team? No, this is not ringworm. It's uh, some kind of a ring. It doesn't, it doesn't look good. You got to go to the doctor. Um, what I was going to say, and this is why I never give you the mic. You squa- standing half right, upright, over another person's mic is the perfect access that you get you, to the Usually show. on my knees on the floor because there's no seat for me to sit on when there's somebody else. It's here. designed. Anyway, I have to go to work soon. So, so let's, uh, hear, let's hear the, the show's criticism. First of all, it's going to be the day after Thanksgiving, so let's wish a happy and a healthy, hopeful Thanksgiving to the Dopey Nation. Yeah, yes, for everybody to be happy and healthy. Uh, we are going to have six. Sixteen. We I, theoretically we had sixteen people here yesterday. It's only sixteen. Sixteen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Every, everybody else is going to different parts of the world, but it's sixteen. So it's good. But I'm the house has to be fixed up for it, which is big work for me. Which is I have to do today. Anyway, what about the show last week? What do you think? It doesn't matter what I think. <laughs> Everyone wants to know what you think. Well, I thought Lily, what's her name? Lily Taylor. Lily Taylor was just uh, too kind to you. She agreed with you way too often. Somebody else said that too. <laughs> so, But she was terrific. She really was. She had some good stories and she was terrific and she was terrific. Nobody wants to hear you like the show. Well, well you got no real criticism these days. Well, you haven't you, been on the show in like five weeks, six weeks. You do overdo um all the time, which of course you don't. Um real- is not a real criticism. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. Well, anyway, whatever. No, and that story. There was an email. What a horrible story that was about this woman throwing out his wallet, uh, stealing his wallet, and uh, and throwing him out of a taxi cab. And or well, it was it was it was convincing. It was a woman who was a heroin addict who was living in the motel and convinced the maintenance man that she loved him only to force him to rob the hotel, give her all of his money, which she stole, and then throw his wallet into the street. It's horrible. Horrible. She wrote a follow-up email. You want to read it? Read it? Oh. Oh. This is, she says, Dave, I wanted the title to be catchy. Where's the title? Oh, (laughs) I don't want to read this. Just read it. Dave, you read my email, you son of a bitch. Anyway, I wanted the title to be catchy so you'd read this email. You you, you read my email on the podcast and said it was the most fucked up story ever. Ha ha. That's awesome. It is definitely, (laughs) that's, yeah, she thinks it's awesome, right? It is she dev- thinks it's awesome that we read the email. <laughs> oh, all right, okay. Is she going to apologize for her actions? Just read no. the email. It is definitely my worst. I have more, just not as bad. I just wanted to say a few things. One, you told Dopey Nation that I had five months clean, but it's actually five years. Oh, terrific. I forgive you. Also, when talking about Chris, I forgot to mention how much I really do love you. Oh, you're witty, smart, well-spoken, funny, entertaining, and the perfect amount of fucked up. It's about time somebody somebody <laughs> complimented me yeah, on this stupid yeah, show. You do, yes, you do need compliments. That's important. I did emphasize this in my previous email, but it's important you know these things. You are my people, and I will always listen to Dopey, and I hope one day I have the pleasure of meeting you in a non-creepy way. I feel like my husband, a recovering crack and Adderall addict, you and I would have one hell of a conversation. Yeah, that's for sure. Hopefully, my husband and I can catch a Dopey con. Lastly, because I sounded so horrible on Dopey, I want to assure you that I am a good person today. 
Very nice. I'm happy. Just read happy. the email. We don't need your commentary as you read. Read it with some feeling. Uh, uh, this is the best. Uh, four years, I spoke at a woman's prison for AA, sponsored women, chaired meetings, and gave back to, to my community. I used to go to AA founders every day, day after day, every year. It's amazing to me that Since. you teach. You know, you can't you can't pronounce anything, and you can't. Why can't you read with feeling? I'm doing a great tell, job. Tell them how you pronounce uh, dolphin. Dolphin. No, how you, you you always did. Well, I'm not going to pronounce it the wrong way. Now I learned how to say it the what right. What are the way. other things that you can't pronounce? Coffee. They say coffee. Okay. Um, I don't know what else. You can think of something. I used to go to AA Founders Day. Uh, Founders Day every year since it's in Akron, Ohio. I've also spoken a few times at Franklin County Courthouse for their drug court program since I graduated in 2012. I just wanted to clarify because I feel like you think I'm a terrible person. Today I attend college while raising two kids. I take them to the sports school functions and strive to be a better mother each day that passes. I am. The this com- is the woman that robs the maintenance. Man. This is fantastic. All right, keep going. This is fantastic. I'm very proud of you. I am the complete opposite of who I was, and I am grateful for that, And because you're not taking drugs anymore. I also heard you speak about the comment on Facebook saying you should have known Chris was using. I think that's bullshit. I know when someone dies, it's easy to find someone to blame, but you are responsible for your sobriety and no one else's. Chris has even said it before. If you have a good amount of clean time and you relapse, you are making a conscious decision to use. Chris was responsible for his own recovery. So many people would have been happy to help him, including you, uh, had he know, and he had to know that. Unfortunately, our disease wants us to keep secrets because secrets keep us sick. Don't ever blame yourself for not seeing the signs. Would it have it been great to intervene? Absolutely. But how can you help someone win a fight when you had no idea that they had stepped into the ring? When I was 21, my best friend had me go cop Xanax for her. This was before I had ever tried heroin. I was addicted to pain pills and alcohol, so I go cop for her and then go out to a bar that night. It was her and I and both our boyfriends. We played darts and drank. Since she was on Xanax and drinking, she was being belligerent and picking fights with her boyfriend. She stormed out of the bar. When I chased after her, she was nowhere to be found. She ended up hitching a ride home with a stranger, and when she got home, she called me, and I yelled to her for hitchhiking. I was mad. The next day, she called me, but I was still mad because she could have been killed hitchhiking, so I ignored her call. That was Saturday. On Sunday, her boyfriend calls me screaming and crying. When he went to her apartment, he found her dead. I was shattered. When her mom got back the autopsy results, it said she overdosed on Xanax and heroin. I never knew she even tried heroin. I blame myself. Why did I get her Xanax? Why didn't I answer her call? Maybe I could have saved her. I finally realized that that I had to let those feelings go because they were tearing me apart inside. It was not my fault. We only have control over, over what we put in our own bodies, not anyone else's. I hope you and Linda are great, and I just know your kids are grateful to have their father physically and emotionally present. Keep the dopey calming. Stay strong and toodles. Amber. Right? Isn't that a powerful email? It's you know, just wonderful, Amber. I, I want to say thank you for sending this. And, and It's a very I, sad story. I apologize if I said anything nasty, except that was then when you were not too well. No, that story was the most fucked up story in the history of the show. This is another terrible story. Oh, absolutely. And, and the fact of the matter is that the people uh, who engage in the kind of stuff that uh, you know dopey people engage in using, just relax, what? What do you have to say? No, what? No. On one of the episodes, the early episodes, yes. you and Chris are having a discussion, and you said, oh, my parents should have known. We should have known about you. I said that on more than one episode. Yeah, you so should now, have known. Now you, yeah, so now you're... Dad, I'm fucking nodding out at the dinner table. Yeah, you, uh, Every holiday, I'm cursing everyone out. I got pinholes for eyes. I'm a mess. Fucking disappearing from the table, nodding out, I'm not just, being my normal self. You should have known. I'm a slow learner. All, all of Amber's <laughs> shit, not with 
understanding. I, I, Amber is not to blame for her 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 uh, friend's death, and I'm not to blame for Chris's death. But I pin my addiction squarely on your shoulders. <laughs> Yo, if you had only, oh, if you and don't mom be had, nation, don't had only this, known, that, that's if you had only known, I I could have avoided years of pain. This boy, terrible. I'm just kidding. I don't care. It's done. Oh, it's, 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 oh you're, you're it's damn water. right. You're kidding. Is right. It's water under the bridge, Amber. I I I rarely will do an email from the same person two weeks in a row. No, this is really wonderful. But I think a lot of people thought you were probably the most fucked up villain in the history of Dopey, especially my dad. So we needed for you to have uh, comeuppance. Is that comeuppance? Uh, I think. You what did. is comeuppance? Do you get what you deserve? So this is not comeuppance. No, this is what you're saying. She's, this is validation. She, this is yes. What's she, another word for this? Um, that this is a good story that she has. That's recovered. not a word. That's yes. a phrase. No. All right. Now before you go, I know you love reading dopey reviews. Oh. So here is the dopey review I, of the week. You ready? Yeah, well, it's about time there was a dopey review. Here, uh, I can't see it there, so you have to oh, read it. Jesus Christ! No, it's it's always good for you to read it. Uh, the top one. Oh, this is that one star review. The new one. Oh, no, that's actually old. This no. one, a new one. Look, what's the date? All right, the date is November 20th. Is uh, well, whatever. Okay, this is, should I say her name? Yeah, sure. Ellie Gray 23, which means something. And this is the review. First of all, she says, dumb, one star dumb. Impulsive, childish, annoying, basically nails on a chalkboard. So which episode did she listen to? I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't think that could possibly be an accurate review. I think she must know me or something. It just, you, you I mean, you is, could say a lot of stuff about Dopey, but I don't think impulsive, childish, annoying, basically nails on a chalkboard. Do you think that that describes uh, an, the show? Annoying could, could hit it, but, okay. but not child. Well, maybe, 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 yeah, maybe, 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 maybe two out of three. And here's a good one. I know you like reading good ones, too. So here's a, here's a good one. Oh, this is a good one, too. You like this one. Oh, this is, this is long. Uh, this is from, I don't know who. Oh, it's really from, great podcast about drugs and recovery. Five stars. Nikkei 666. Oh, that's not... Good, right? 666. Just read the thing. Still really loving show, but I just heard the girl calling about Wigger comment. I think it was, that's a long time. I think it was funny comment and it was very descriptive to me. One of the reasons I love the show is that it is not censored or politically correct. I hate to see it go that way. If you're going to have to walk on eggshells not to offend or trigger anyone. So I, so I think people need to get a thicker skin and if they know it's not meant to be racist or mean, it's not everybody else's problem. Just my two cents. Whether you're sober or not, this podcast is entertaining and informative. Normally, I stay away from recovery topics, but I really enjoy this. I just stumbled across this podcast and just listened to the Andy Roy episode, and it was really amazing and entertaining. All right. That's I, a nice review. Yeah, and I agree with her. I, I, I think it's a guy, but what do you agree with? I agree that you have to be a little bit more thick-skinned and and not to be so politically correct. As long as, as you know, if you're joking, that at least people get the joke, and uh, or at least explain what you mean when you when you when you're saying something. I don't think I, I disagree. I don't think I need to explain anything. If I explain it, it's not funny. Now, thank you for coming on the show. It's always a pleasure. Kind of. And uh, this week, we have an interview on the phone with a guy named Michael DeBar. Have you ever heard of Michael DeBar? No, I have not. Michael DeBar is a world-famous rock and roll star. He was in a band called Silverhead. He was in a band called Detective. And he wrote the song Obsession. You're my obsession. I'm sure you like to dance to that at bar mitzvahs. Yes, my obsession. What do you want me to be to let me sleep with you? I will have you. You know that I song? Never heard. He of also it. starred on the hit TV show MacGyver. Oh, I heard of that as show. the villain Murdoch, oh. and now he has a radio show on Little Steven's Underground Garage, which is a place that I hope to wind up one place one day. What is that? It's some radio show on Sirius that I'd love to host one day. It's one oh, of my dreams. You could host it, or well, it's not going to happen. What do you mean? Uh, Anybody could host it. You could host it if you got no, the job. No, I'm not hosting it. Imani works for that guy. Oh, really? That's why she's the linchpin in my plan of becoming yeah, a it's DJ. A, it's a loose pin. Yes, yes. it's not. It's um, not too good. Anyway, so Michael DeBar coming up. Um, 
All right. Stay strong, Dope Nation. All right. And so goodbye. Happy holiday. And uh, stay strong. And you sound terrible. Well, I'm okay. <clears throat> and toodles for everybody. Are you going to go to the doctor about the ringworm? I don't have ringworm. Well, you told me you did. Uh, I'm just your diagnosis, not mine. I, I do not know what ringworm looks like. You said I might be ringworm, and no, you made a nervous face. Uh, me too. Um, I know. I, I am nervous, but not that. I'm Are you going to go see Herb today or no? Not today. Why, when are you going to go? Tomorrow. Man. What if Herb's not in tomorrow? Then I can't go tomorrow. All right. Thank you, Dad. Goodbye. I love you. Goodbye, Bye, everybody. So it's very exciting. I've immersed myself in uh, this man for the past couple days because out of nowhere, I got the opportunity to get him on the phone. It is rock and roll and television legend, Michael DeBar. Welcome. And movies. And movies. Wait, hold on. Let me check the sound. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not 100 percent on this sound for some reason. Talk to me for a second. Yeah. On in. Hi, Michael Debar, right here. It's, I'm getting a delay. Yeah. No, we're super so good. Better, the sound. I was worried for a start, second, yeah. but I would hate to have a guest of your caliber derailed by bad sound. So move. But I, I listen to you on a bunch of podcasts, and I've been listening to your little Stephen Underground Garage show. So I'm immersed in in Michael Daybar, and I've really enjoyed everything I've heard. Just so you know. Well, I'm so glad. Thank you. I'm sure that means a lot to you. Um, I think my favorite thing is that you have a new band called The Mistakes, which is That's such right. a good rock and roll band name. Well, you know, I mean, not getting metaphysical immediately, but I would say that all of the great things I've ever done have been a mistake. Wow. You know? And and I think in retrospect, you know, it's a lesson. It's an experience that is a lesson. And, um, you know, when you think you know everything and everything goes right, you know, it's usually pretty um, sort of ordinary, you know, you've achieved something, but not something magical. And my whole life has been about I've got to create something that, you know, sparkles in a unique way rather than, you know, going through the motions of being an actor or being a singer or whatever it is. You know, I mean, it's all the same. Davey, you know, it's all the same to me. I've pursued bands. You know, I'm I'm a terrible musician, uh, amateur musician, but I've always fancied. Let me let me stop you right. Let me stop you right there, please. No, you're not. Why do you say that? Well, because I like are you, I, well, who are you comparing yourself to? I need to put myself down. I'm comparing myself to you and your contemporaries. That's absurd. You, you know. need to put yourself down. It's built in. Did you hear what you just said? Oh, here we go. This is going to be good. Talk me. This is something I've been going through that I have this inner monologue. Well, let me tell you right away, Davey. Never say that again. You are what you say you are. I'm a fucking genius. I'm the handsomest man in the world. I'm the greatest lover, the best dancer, the best slide guitar player in the fucking world. Do you play slide guitar? What did I just say? Oh, sorry. My bad. This is the. So don't describe yourself. I'm a lousy musician or this or that. Why are you doing that? Well, What's let's, the point? Let's talk about it. You know, like, I think I'm the, talking point, about the it. point is for me, I have this deep seated belief. I have this, it's kind of a classic addict fucking thing where I feel, on one hand, I'm super brilliant and great, but if I say it, it undoes it and it, and it makes who, me. Who determined that rule? I don't know. It's deep into my psyche. It's embedded. What is your psyche? Describe your psyche. My psyche is one that uh, exalts me and thinks I am. I think I'm a great podcaster. Let's go with that one. Okay. Okay. Well, let's well, go with that one. Well, I've got Fuck good news. I've got good news for you, Michael Daybar. Okay. You are on the greatest podcast that's ever been made. Well, this is the kind of thing that I want to hear from people. I'm, I'm being aggressive about it because we're in such a fog, Davey. We have these lines that we describe ourselves as. We have this, this is my favorite woman. This is the, the greatest that, the greatest this. Everything has something to offer. Every human being, every movie, even if it sucks, there's something there. To to disparage yourself clearly is not the way to lead this one go around the sun. Right. Is it? I think I do it as a disarming technique, but I think you're right. Well, I'm not disarmed by it. I'm infuriated by it. So maybe when you do this next, you can think of that that English maniac was screaming at me to be myself. But I think your infuriation has disarmed you. So I think mission accomplished. 
Well, you know, I don't want to be disarmed. I want there to be no violence and no guns in this uh, world. And I want us to realize that we're all equal, that we're all the same, that we all share the same secrets. And to posture as a sort of a terrible musician is probably not going to do you any good. All right. I, I, I will take that and I will move past it and I will feel, I will feel uh, empowered and I will feel Oops. good. And happy because I am happy to have you on the phone. And um, everything I've I've heard, you know, you are a legendary musician and a legendary performer. But the stuff that I heard was really just about joy. And I, and I loved yes. I loved hearing you talk about uh, your life uh, to have joy. I mean, you were talking about I think depressed people and that you've been through your share, but you refuse to live like that, right? Well, I am uh, absolutely um, open to being depressed about something, but I don't see it as as a negative. You see, what it does is it opens a door. Why am I feeling, you know, blue? What what is is going on here? I lost her. My mother died. I've I've been kicked out of something. Um, You know, one learns. I think that the, the most frightening things are the most important things because once you get over the fear of depression and grief and sadness, you'll be in the clear. You'll realize that life is always right. No matter what happens to you, it's right. You're not going to be able to do anything about it, dude. You know, mom's dead, mom's dead. Right. Um, But my favorite thing also that I heard you say, it's like the impermanence factor. Like that, yeah. that who you are today or even who I, who I was this morning on the phone with you is not necessarily who I'm going to be when I hang up with you. And I love no, that you idea. You certainly won't be, you know, and, and we change like the weather changes. You know, we are the weather, you know. I mean, I don't want to sound too fucking corny here, but the poetry of life is what I believe in, you know, and I, I do believe that um, if you have a conscience and the conscience is just self-awareness, isn't it really? You know, that you can look at yourself and say, okay, well, that's ridiculous. (laughs) I've just been able, you know, I'm 71 years old, so I've had a long time to prune away, um, you know, the darkness and just just get into the light, man, you know, and shine it on everybody you meet. I also in feel like way, in whatever way it can be very aggressive it can be very charming it can be seductive but or secretive sort of me and you we know right you know stuff like that but I refuse to be depressed by the political climate I think it's um, even more important for us to fight the good fight well I love that and our show is primarily about drugs addiction and dumb shit and I think you have uh, you have some knowledge about this stuff uh, you came up in England. You are the son of an aristocrat. I, I, the quote I heard was, uh, you have the blood of a stripper and the crown of an aristocrat. <laughs> well, you know, some strippers wear crowns. That's and that's true. my new album title, you know. The Mistakes. Some strippers wear crowns. That's right, baby. All right. So talk, talk about that. Like, you, you're, you, you grew up in England, uh, the son of a very wealthy aristocrat, and your mother was some sort of a dancer, correct? That's right, yeah, yeah. I, I would question the idea of like, gr- growing up, however. <laughs> I don't know if I ever really did. I think I've grown down. Yeah. I mean, in a way, you know, I've, st- I've stayed sort of like wide eyed and innocent, but like decadent and, and debauched at the same time, Michael debauched. I don't know why. I think I've had such a r- ridiculous life, you know, born into the British aristocracy, and my mother was a stripper um, and a whore, and uh, I never knew them. I was put away in boarding schools at a very young age, and there I stayed in the vacation time. I you never, never knew them. You never knew either of them. I didn't know them, no. I, I met them um, later on in my life, you know, when I was about 30. Wow. And, uh, but I had all the largesse of his inheritance and, uh, you know, uh, the estate and so on and so forth. But at the same time, uh, my mother was rather odd, at schizophrenic at an in- institution. And uh, so I denied and negated any money, anything from them. Because like a young, aggressive kid, I was disgusted by their parental, um, you know, the lack of parental, um, shall we say, discipline, love. Um, And I struck out on my own. And when I left boarding school at 16 years old, I went to drama school. And within weeks, I was into So With Love with Sidney Poitier. And that started an incredible 
life, you know, and I lived it myself. I mean, I, you know, earned a lot <laughs> you know, as a young actor and then got into rock and roll, you know, and, and pre, the beat goes on. Pre-16, where did you get your love from then? Just out of curiosity. Myself. Wow. So that, that must be very difficult and crazy. Um, but you do seem to have like a lot of love in you right now and a lot of resolve. I had a lot of love in me then. Of course. But it's, it's still like a hard way to come up. It's very, it's very Dickensian or even Harry Potter to me. It, well, Harry Potter, I know nothing about, but Dickens I do. And, um, you know, the advantage was, Davey, at these schools, they had these incredible libraries. You know, this is the upper echelon of education in England, which I do not recommend. It's hypocritical, it's masturbatory, it's homoerotic, it's disgusting. Um, but I learned a lot. I learned about the perils and the evils of British society, the, the class system, but I also learned literature. And I read everything. I also listened to Howling Wolf and read Charles Dickens, you know, so I had a, an incredible education, which is counter to rock and roll, because I'm not going to go up and stage and go, good evening, everyone. Let me hear you say yes. Right. You know, right. It's right. a different vibe. So you have to be, because all rock and roll at that time, late 60s, was British working class, as you know. So um, one had to adopt yet another persona, which I've done my whole life. Right. It's all been, uh, um, in, in varying degrees, an act. But the difference is that I wrote it. Right, and it also, but do you think it really is an act, or do you think it's born in you and then sort of transcribed through these things? Well, let me ask you, if you describe yourself as a useless musician, who wrote that story? Well, I didn't say useless. I just said not that great. I didn't say useless. I write some really good songs, Michael. I have some really good songs. Oh, I've now written. it comes out. Dude, I'm you pretty good. Use yourself as an amateur musician. Useless, whatever word you want to use, that's what you describe yourself as. Right, but I told right. you it so was it was a wrote, manipulation, uh, Michael. Did, I was, who wrote that? Did you write that? I, I guess so. I think it was through the filter of a very domineering Jewish mother. Ah, now we're now getting, we're getting somewhere. somewhere. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> when, okay, so when, now let's. So you had a Jewish mother who was dominating and wouldn't let you be fabulous, and I I had myself. So I was my mother, not Jewish non-denominational mother who said, Michael, you're really good at soccer. Michael, you can run like a motherfucker. Wow. You like Otis Redding. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I love that. I so love that. One writes it oneself. It's I'm a, not going to let a, you know, be an apologist for myself. I'm going to be a champion for myself. And, and to be totally fair, I'm, I'm, I'm both. You know what I mean? Like I, I crank out this podcast every week. We have a, a great and beautiful community, and I've always wanted to do this. So obviously I'm not just beating myself up constantly. And my Absolutely right. Now let's get to what you do, you know, that is beautiful. Look what you're giving to people. You're giving people hope and faith. And, and by joy. being you. And good you times. Know, and joy. Yeah. Well, you know, wake up one morning and do that and write a song about it. All right. You know, I have a great song. It's called I Want to Be Good So Bad. You should play it on your tour oh, of that's Japan. that's such a wonderful title. I think you'd like it. But I want to well, hear. you know. Uh, I'm yeah. sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please, what are you going to say? Please go. No, no, no. I, I was going to ask, when did you get exposed to uh, rock and roll? Like, when did that happen, and what was the experience? Well, blues, the blues, the blues. When, when I was in school, there was this friend of mine, Steve Thompson. You know, if I had any friends there, he was one of them. And um, he was uh, really obsessed with American music. This is uh, would be, you know, 1965, I don't know if that's 68, 69, 70. He had a collection of Sonny Boy and Muddy Waters and, and, and Lead Belly and Helen Wolf and, you know, all of the wonderful blues men. And I thought, what is this? And I, I, you know, like everybody else, like Ronnie Wood, you know, on a barge on the Thames, he was a gypsy, you know, working class. You know, if for some reason, post-World War II, young men and women in England adopted the blues as the soundtrack to their lives. And I got turned on very early and then... You know, it progressed into other things when I left school, and then I did that movie, and the Mindbenders were in the movie, 60s rock band, incredible, I thought I want to do that, you know, and I carried on acting as a, a kid, but I got more and more into rock and roll, rock and roll as exemplified by the Yardbirds, the Rolling Stones, the Faces, I saw the Faces. 
in 1970 in London at the Queen Elizabeth Hall. Uh, he, Rod was in pink satin. Ronnie Wood was in, you know, leopard skin. They had a bar on stage. And that is what I wanted to do. It was a bolt and of lightning to your brain. I understand. That's what I did, yeah. And when did, when did drugs get into the picture? Well, I did hashish from 16. I would eat hashish. That, that, that was the beginning of my, um, you know... Uh, dabbling and why but didn't dabble you, you didn't it smoke it you didn't smoke it you ate no 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 no. i ate it why get higher quicker you know i never That's ate i never ate hashish well don't try it yeah it's, it's, I've, I've, <laughs> I I, I've, I've missed anybody it. listening but it was the quickest uh, you know hash. this is pre-cocaine psychosis i did hashish when i was a teenager and did it all through up until coke happened and when coke happened for two or three years, I was elevated. You know, it was amazing. And then, of course, the psychosis kicked in. Now, my life is very parallel with the history of rock and roll and narcotics. You know, the, the, the trajectory of narcotics in rock and roll world is just that. At the beginning of the 70s, people started to realize that cocaine was creating psychosis. And you were fucking crazy. And you were owned by that drug. When I was a kid eating hashish, it was just one big Keith Richards living room. You know, it was uh, this incredible Moroccan-inspired, beautiful boys and girls drifting around Chelsea. Good time, Pais yeah, Paisley, Paisley as times. You, as you've read about it, yeah. Well, it wasn't so much Paisley. I was never a big Paisley fan. I like solid colors. Okay, <laughs> though. To, to um, be perfectly frank. But I love, I mean, so when did, because uh, you were basically, I love that you progressed uh, with the sort of story of rock and roll, and I'm steeped in the story. Like, I've read everything I could get my hands on, and, you know, I grew, I, I was born in 1974, so, like, I got to experience this and that, but I really, as soon as I became a uh, uh, teenager, I became obs I, I was into the blues too. I learned how to play harmonica when I was like 16, and I got really into blues harmonica. And then I got into the history of rock and roll, and it just, you know, astonished me, and I loved it. And there's just something so special about it. I think uh, the music and the time and the culture and, uh, and the philosophy, it all turned into something really beautiful, and you got to be there firsthand. Was it as good as it sounded in the books? Some nights. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, life is is what it is then, now. It's the same. Um, in those days, what was going on was not only were we changing as individuals um, on a morality level, but the culture was changing. So there was a certain spearheading of a counterculture which negated authority um, and was, you know, a three-chord anarchy, as I describe it. And it wasn't just the music that one was enveloped in. It was the changing of, 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 of the mores of the time, you know, the fact that one could actually, you know, have a very sensual life with, without being arrested. Um, but then again, one was arrested <laughs> you know, for various things. The point being is it wasn't just like, you know, Howlin' Wolf. You know, it was a howling society that was trying to negate this revolution. So it was very, very much more than just rock and roll. So when does it go from good times to cocaine psychosis? Like when does cocaine psychosis? When oh. I came to America, um, you know, I, I would smoke hash and, we'd, you know, I had this beautiful uh, girlfriend who became my first wife, uh, Wendy, who uh, we would dress alike, cloaks, you know, shag hair, makeup, hashish, parties. Then I'd go and make some money, you know, as an actor, a young kid. And, and I did this musical, you know, in London, this nude musical. And um, in 70, 70, 1970, Dirty Show in Town, it was called. Andrew Lloyd Webber came to see it, and I sang in it. I played an androgynous rock star, what a shock, uh, called Rose. And Andrew Lloyd Webber said, you know, that's good. Um, do you have any songs? And I said, yes, of course I do. I didn't, but I wrote them. And then I went to his flat and played for his friends, and, and he got me a record deal And called, in a band called Silverhead, which then went to New York City and Coke. Yeah. So the United States is responsible for my cocaine addiction. <laughs> That's and I learned a lot. I, but it was the beginning of a realization, you know, because I got sober in 81, so I started, you know, hard drugs in 72, heroin, all of it. 
and then uh, and dried up in 81 1981 and got sober you know and uh, and it was a hell of an experience i can't even imagine so much stuff was happening can you think of anything that really stood out as that was the most exciting or the most dangerous thing in in the heyday of your rock and roll career or the question about what is the most exciting uh, was the whiskey a go go for the first week that we played in 1972 i had a tiger and i brought a tiger on stage i rented a tiger and i went on stage with a tiger and they went and he took a shit in the first song that was exciting that's perfect though that's perfect for the mistakes it's like i'm gonna get a tiger and you don't think about the tiger shitting on the stage when you get it right the t- no, no, no. I was thinking how beautiful the tiger was. But the tiger was on more drugs than I was. But the, the thing is that at, that at that time, it was different. There was no security. We all stayed at the Hyatt Hotel. We arrived at the Hyatt Hotel. Rodney Bingenheim arrived at the airport and picked us up with a whole, you know, like a literal, you know, um, bunch of cars full of beautiful girls. We all went to the Hyatt Hotel. There was a hearse outside the hotel with a tiger in the back of the hearse. And the driver was dressed like a sort of a safari hunter with the hat with the tiger suit. Right? So I said, well, what, what, you know, the first thing I said, well, what is it? What are you doing? And he said, this tiger is the star of a TV show called Daktari. And some of your older listeners perhaps will remember there was a TV show about this, this animal farm. So I said, can I rent it for the week? And he said, sure. So we took the tiger upstairs Literally, man, uh, on a leash up to the um, floor that we had because we had a floor with each band member next to each other as we always traveled because we all loved each other. And it, that week, with this tiger roaming the hallways with these girls and these you know, coke dealers and everybody in leopard skin was spectacular. Wasn't were, was anybody afraid of the tiger? I'd be fucking terrified of the tiger. It, well, that's you. Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, um, no, it became a symbol of of the fierceness of of, of the world, and we loved him, and and he loved us, um, and we had him for a week, and nobody cared because the, the couple of guys that were sort of the you know working at the hotel, you know, this is the massive Hyatt Hotel, christened the Riot Hotel right. by a great deal of authors that pretend to know what happened. And the tiger, you know, listen, we'd be getting the guy a blowjob um, while we just went down to the kitchens and did whatever and got whatever we wanted. I mean, it's a different time. Yeah, definitely. But you had just said a second ago, like that a time is what it is like between now and then, but it was much different. I mean, I guess the industry was smaller, so it felt smaller, but I don't know. The music seemed the much... industry was smaller. What I mean what is, mean? it was before it was this billion-dollar industry. So you're staying at the Hyatt instead of like. Well, it was still you know, the Beatles. Are you kidding me? <laughs> but the money. This is 1972, not 1962. Right, but the money was. Isn't the scope different? Like you're having like these artists nowadays who are in the billions of dollars, and it's like. Well, I don't think that makes any difference. Does it really, Davey? Does that really make any? Difference? You know, you know, success is success. You know. The, the, Absolutely. How much money you make is irrelevant. I think what I mean is... You make a lot of money then, you make more now because you you pitch and shill for perfume. I think what I mean now, what I mean about smallness is like that you actually are with the other people in the community. Like you're sharing a floor and and you're seeing the fans and you can touch what's around you. You're not, you know... Cast. I mean, I guess the Beatles were thrown into the back of a car and didn't see much, but it seemed like back then there was a lot more interaction. You know. Well, if I may, if I may interject, the, please. My band really only played clubs. We didn't become super famous at all. The bigger bands did have a sort of a um, a difficult time relating to fans and stuff because there were so many. When I was with the Pan Station. And I'm standing in the lobby next to John Taylor in 1985, and there's glass windows in the lobby, and 2,000 girls break the glass window and run towards John Taylor. That's, that's something that my band, Silverhead, did not experience. What we did experience was 
30 girls running to our hotel rooms and being able to get in. Right, which is almost advantageous because you get to have the 30 girls, which is beautiful. Um, now, when basically you you went from enjoying the, the Michael debauched life to feeling prisoner by it, what was the transition between the, the enjoyment of drugs to the not enjoying of the drugs? It's a great question. And, and the answer is when you're owned by something, and you're not owning it by you know, having fun with it and enjoying it and being stimulated by it, and now you're desperate for it. That is the moment that you go, "Oops." Do you remember? Do you remember when that moment hit? You know what? That's also a great question. No, because I was in such a fog of despair and um, feeling, uh, you know, this this strange feeling that I never really felt, which was that I was not. Um, able to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it, but I had to do something. You know, it, you have to cop, you know. So the machinations of that were numbing, and I wasn't feeling a damn thing except I've, j- I've just got to get high. That's it. Yeah. And what happened was, how that stopped was I was with Zeppelin and um, we were out one night and, and we were playing some game of some kind where you had to shoot, you know, drink a shot of tequila if you made a mistake in the game. Again, mistakes, you know, it's always about the mistake. Boom, drink. And I was just losing, I was stoned, I was losing. And, and my dear friend, Danny Goldberg, who was Peter Grant's right hand man, Peter Grant was the manager sure. of Led Zeppelin, sure. um, uh, you know, was, became my dearest friend. He swept everything off the table. And he took me back to the hotel. Within 24 hours, his best friend, who was his partner in Gold Mountain Records that put out Stevie Nicks' solo album, took me to an AA meeting. And from that day, 1981, um, I've been sober. Right, and well, that's awesome. So there was never, there was never a backslide on that. Um, but where do we... No. You went from your your in the story. I thought you said you were taking shots with Led Zeppelin. In was that that was in 1981, was it? No, it was the the, the beginning of Danny's realization. I was an alcoholic. Right, right. <laughs> you know, and we uh, we you know after time went by, he realized that I was truly fucked up. And you know, if you t- take everything off the table. Um, and it's Led Zeppelin and it's Peter Grant it was really monstrous but wonderful to me you know this is late 70s but it set the seeds it sowed the seeds of okay you know you've got to get sober and it took me a while it took me a while to be able to hear you know that I need that's what I needed you know and thank God with Paul this guy Paul's insistence you know and it, t- it took a while you know, but I knew from that moment on that I had to get sober, but I didn't. You know, and that period of time was the worst time. Right. I, I was. Uh, I was not a big coke user. I. Uh, I was a total pothead. And I discovered heroin while I was producing television and and hosting television, and I found that it really calmed me down. And I then I thought I could afford it, so I just became this basic heroin addict who took uh, anti anxiety medication. Did you find yourself as a heroin addict also, or was it just a smattering of drugs, or did you ever get a heroin habit? No, I, I well, no, not really. I mean, I, I did it like everybody else, but my, my thing was to stay up because of the, the whole the rock and roll routine. You know, I, I got to be awake. I got to be on tour. You know, I, hundreds and hundreds of gigs, you know, over the years, and um, I had to stay up. Take what you can. You know, the, right. You, yeah. So heroin, like then that would be, okay, you got 10 days. <laughs> you know. So then I would get into it. But I was never a heavy he- a heroin user. And, uh, it was all about cocaine and booze. Yeah. Right. And what, what was the thing that you heard at that first meeting that really like spoke to you? Like what, 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 did, what changed in you? Like what were you? Because I've heard you talk about it and you, I've heard you say over and over again that it was vanity. 
you know, that you didn't like how you looked. And I, I think that's funny. And I'm sure you looked great even at your most bloated. Um, <laughs> but I'm sure there was something else besides vanity. Yeah, it was. There, there, there was a, a, a loneliness. And when I walked into that room, I wasn't alone anymore. You know, you'll hear it a thousand times. But I, I'm absolutely, stoically, um, will stay with the idea of, of narcissism. Or, right. or vanity, you know. I mean, I I, I knew, you know, in deeply and spiritually inside that this was dreadful because I was owned by this drug, ridiculous. But I also looked in the mirror and I I just looked so awful and so sad, you know, as well as like um, you know uncool. And uh, and and so when I went to that meeting and I saw all these beautiful people, who who were uh, you know I didn't feel sort of like a, a lonely creature, you know. I was embraced by these people. This is a long time ago. This is when people smoked <laughs> at meetings and it was a naked light bulb sobriety. This is a long time ago. It's almost 40 years ago. Well. When, you know, when getting sober was not a career move. Right. In fact, it's, it's interesting that you should say that because you went on to some really big bands after that where you were the only sober person. Was it was it difficult to be the like in Checkered Past when you're in a band with yes. uh, with yeah. Steve Jones and Andy? Ta- was Andy Taylor in that one? No, no, it was Clem Burke on drums, from Steve Blondie. Jones, the Pistols, yeah. Nigel from Blondie, yeah. um, and Tony Sales from Tim Machine, Bowie's Tim Machine. And we formed this band called Checker Pass, and yeah, they were all using, and I was recently sober, you know, like two or three years. And, um, you know, one's nodding out, one's crawling up the wall, and, and the other two are drunk, and I've got the big book going, hey, fellas. Um, <laughs> no, so, but like in that situation, when you say it's not a career move to get sober, does it almost no. make you uncool amongst your contemporaries? Oh, I was a leper, a pariah for years. Yeah. And you, but, but you, mean, was it the conviction to, what, why did you, like, how did you stay with it? If you're this because pariah? I, because I said no. <laughs> no, thanks. And whenever you say no to somebody who's offering you something, you never speak to them again. Or they'll rather they'll never speak to you again. You know, it, it, look, cocaine was simply like uh, you know um, a rite of passage for rock and rollers. So they 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 kept on doing it, but they didn't realize it was destroying them. You know, and I could see it. It was a very very difficult time for me. I felt very lonely, but I had Miss Pamela. You know, I had a wife and a son, and um, that was my um, shall we say my, my life. You know, I loved them. And uh, I had that. I didn't need some bass players' uh, affection. congratulatory totally. affection. No. How old was your son when you got clean? Oh God, it was three. No, wait a minute. He was. He's now. He's, he's two. Right. My my daughter was four when I finally gave everything up and it was a big Great. deal and I did it because I didn't want to be a shit parent like I just didn't want to be that guy Great. I didn't do it Understood. for her I just didn't want to be a shit parent you know what I mean yep um and I heard so many amazing stories like I'm a huge uh Steve Jones fan uh mm, me too. his music his his book is fucking awesome and uh his personality he's funny and everything and um you know I heard the story about him stealing your clothes you know that was in his book and selling them but i just heard you tell a story about copping for him in new york yeah that's right will you tell that story well i was sober and he couldn't move so what am i gonna do well did you do it because you had to play the show i did it because he needed it and there was no time for therapy yeah, yeah. It's one of those things that it really stays with me, which is why I tell people about it, you know, on my radio show and other places, because it's, it, it, it was a dilemma. It was an Arturian thing. It was really a fable, this, this incredible moment where, okay, the choice is he's going to, you know, be shaking and quivering in this in hotel room on his own, or I go to Alphabet City and I cop and I come back and I give it to him and get through the next three days and then we go back to L.A. and then he will go into treatment. And that was my reasoning. 
I can be judged for it either way. I could give a fuck. How, All I know is he's a happy man. How grateful was he? Because I can only imagine that situation. Like, did he? Did no, he, he wasn't grateful at all. You know, um, I, you know. In, in retrospect, of course, but at the time. There's no sense of gratitude. Thank you, thank you for that. You know, I mean, he just, he just got back on track, and, and we did a couple of gigs and back to LA, man. You know, um, I didn't expect gratitude. I, ju I just realized I didn't want him to die in front of me, and um, I, I love him. I love him to this day with all my heart. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. I, I think I think that's a story that people will be like, I can't believe you got him dope, but to be within the culture. And to keep the the train rolling, and and thank God he didn't die. You know what I mean? That's the only way the story is not a good story. Well, um, it's not. It's it's a great story. It's it's an incredibly important story, and you can be on either side of it. Oh, how could you, Michael? Why didn't you just get him into treatment right away? I was recently sober, and I was a nutcase. It didn't just because I stopped coke didn't mean that I turned into a saint that knew what to do. I had no idea what to do, you know, and uh, but I did that, and um, things seem to have worked out okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, history can be the the teacher in this one. Uh, tell us about your recovery, like from the beginning. I mean, it's, you're talking about thirty nine years, right? Thirty eight years, thirty eight years. Like, uh, how how was it at first, and and has there been ebbs and flows? Like, do you ever think about using thirty eight years later? Well, which question are you asking? First, do you ever think about using 38 years later? No. All right. How was the beginning? <laughs> Difficult. All right. Yeah, come on. Give me the nice Michael Daybar long form answer. Help me out here. I'm forming my answer for you. Take your time. Um, the difficulties were that when, when you used to uh, that lifestyle, your whole world changes because you have no friends. So therefore, and because I had a wife and child, it was bearable. Um, I really didn't feel anything. I was almost anesthetized for the first year um, because everything changed. But what happened was I became obsessed with physical fitness and, and diet. Nice. And I worked out every day as I do to this day hence I have a 29 inch waist and <laughs> and um, it seemed to subligate it seemed to take the place of the obsession now the word obsession became terribly important to me because I wrote that song which was that was the know, next question yeah yeah and which has aided me to live the way I live today and and but it's it's just such a miracle that that happened that way. That everybody was saying to me, "Oh, we're obsessed with drugs. We're obsessed with alcohol," and the word itself became this. So I'm working out every day and becoming really healthy um, physically, which mutated into my spiritual health. Then this song came along, and boom! It was a, a massive hit all over the world, and that was my gift. So it, I got away with it. Everybody's going to be like, what on earth is happening, you know, in the first year? But that first year was the rite of passage. So how long were you clean before Obsession came out? Oh, let's see. Quite some, let's see, four years, three so, or four years. I mean, I think that's really interesting in itself because the song, I bet you to a lot of people, was a drug anthem. Right. Well, no, because I wrote it. Um, I, I wrote it about romanticism and the obsession of love and relationships. And this guy, I'd seen a movie called The Collector, starring Terence Stamp, and it was about a young man who wins the lottery and has had his eye on this girl for so long, and then wins the lottery, buys a house in the country, kidnaps her, takes her down to the house. So, I, the, if you listen to the lyric, it's about the obsession of a young man for a young woman. But it is really just a metaphor for uh, um, anything you're obsessed with. Sure. Obsession. But I, I turned it, because it's a pop song, I turned it into a romance rather than, you know, I'm in love with heroin, which Lou would have done, you know, right. or Lou Reed did do. But in my case, I wanted a hit fucking record. Well, it was a hit record. And I only say that drug anthem thing because 
as time passed, it became the theme song in all of these 80s movies of partying and underground and darkness. You know, even if the song wasn't born there, it kind of, you could imagine, like, if you hear the song, those kinds of images flash in the head. That's a really, that's a great take on it. Because, you know, I say, I will have you, I will have you. Exactly. And so it was very dangerous. And one can interpret danger as drug addiction, of course. And so, yes, it was dark. And, you know, the thing about that song is that it has remained in the culture for all these years. Absolutely. Every year somebody cuts it, you know, or it's in some movie exactly as you described so eloquently, some nightclub, some sort of debauched gathering. <laughs> and um, I just think it's my legacy. Well, I think it's, I think it's an awesome tune. And I think uh, I can imagine, though, in that time, almost like... Was there any, like, nervousness then about using, like, being in that scene, having this pulsating beat and probably a million beautiful people doing drugs around you? Did it ever, was there ever kind of any temptation in that period? No. I I think to answer your question, again, a great question, Davey. You sure know your stuff. I, I felt that they were idiots. Right. Well, there you go. I love that. That's a perfect answer. You know, and I, I think that's that's like a weird thing for me now in my recovery. I, I'm I'm only sober. I, I'll rephrase that. I'm sober for four years and a couple months, which is uh, the longest I've ever had, and my life is by far the best it's ever been. Um, you know, I have two lovely daughters. I have a beautiful partner. My life is beautiful, and uh, yeah, and I get to great. be the closest version of who I ever wanted to be now because of it. And I love that. It's like the best. Um, And I can look at people using and be like, they're fucking idiots. But I know that I was once just as idiotic, you know? Yeah, sure. You know, I'm just abbreviating it. I mean, I feel deep compassion for those who are lost and owned. You still go to meetings? No. Never, ever, ever? Never, ever, ever. Well, this is a great thing that you get to do uh, because... Uh, we are reaching people who are using, who are newly sober, you know. And then the other thing that I think is fascinating is that, you know, I think if I was to Google you, which I have numerous times, um, the things that pop up are Power Station, Obsession, and MacGyver, the amazing television show on ABC when I was just a lad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, see, I was a, a, an A-team guy, a Knight Rider guy, a fucking Dukes of Hazard guy, because I was yeah. I was an idiot American. I didn't get to watch MacGyver, but uh, uh-huh. it must have been quite a scene to 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 be so uh, seminally involved. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Yes, I did it for five years, you know, so, um, and I still do it on the reboot, I, um, on the reboot of MacGyver on CBS. Uh, it, it was an amazing thing to be Murdoch. See, the, the thing is, just going back to the idea of um, not going to meetings, my life is a meeting. Yeah. I'm talk, talking to you. Right? Absolutely. This is a meeting that's going to re- meet a lot of people. I have five million listeners on my radio program, and they all know I'm sober. What more can I do? You don't. I'm, you don't have to do anything. I mean, I think uh, that is. You're carrying the message either way. You know what I mean. I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, people all. Everybody that is, gives a shit about me or in any way, um, you know, knows where I'm coming from. And I, you know, a clean, loving life is what I espouse every day. Cool. Let's just shift gears for a second. Something else that I had read about you was your interest in the occult. Yeah. How did How did you wind up uh, getting interested in that? Well, it, well, it, it was a, a rite of passage or a wrong of passage, depending on you know, which angle you're coming from. I mean, in those days, in the late 60s, early 70s, there was a great deal of experimentation with drugs and sexuality and clothes and the culture itself. And um, like all sort of the dandified Brits, um, I was fascinated by Aleister Crowley and his powers and so on and so forth. So one went into that. And then getting Sandra Swan's song, where Jimmy was extremely interested in, in that, um, that fueled that interest. Uh, he, he just bought Crowley's house in Bolskin, you know. Um, so one was getting closer and closer to this, this force, which I became 
pretty early on absolutely disgusted by the bestiality and the absurdity of black magic. I'm into white magic. I'm into pale magic. I'm into pink magic. You know, the magic of life and love and expression and self-expression, creativity and romance. I'm the opposite of all of that demonic bullshit, which, by the way, is conjured up by the mind. It has nothing to do with reality. What was that you know, scene? What was it like? The 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 black magic bestiality scene, even like what 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 did it look like? Well, that you'd have to have your listeners look up. I'm not going to describe bestiality to you, but I, <laughs> you know, use your imagination. Yes. Um, and uh, another thing that always interests me was like when I took drugs. It was almost like magic, like the idea of a, a magic word and everything changed. I took a subject, a substance and things changed. Um, was the drugs included within the magic or was it just sort of like a, a coinciding situation? When you go to a party, you know, <laughs> you drink and you take drugs. And the party was the dabbling in the dark arts, which is bullshit. Uh, at the time, it's romantic, dramatic, theatrical. I think the Theosophical Society in the late 1900s and early 1900s in England was very much uh, caught up in that. The dandified, eccentric, individualistic, aristocratic bullshit that they were so bored that they needed something to titillate them, which is what Alistair Crowley was. He was born into a very wealthy family and he uh, subscribed to the notion of um, absolute utter boredom. So what happens when the rich get bored? They go further and further into something that will give them a hard on, that will get them excited. And so Satanism and all of that crap uh, suddenly became appealing because it was different. I remember well, in our case in rock and roll, it was different. So we were trying to be above and beyond the civilized world. You know, we were rock and roll musicians and therefore had to dabble in the black arts. It was almost de rigueur, it's like wearing high heel boots. It was as simple as that. It was a fashion. Right, right, gotcha. And and it's kind of blown out of proportion in, in the after effects, I suppose. I just want to be blown. I don't want to, want to be blown out. <laughs> I, I can relate. Um, when you got sober, was that the end of the black magic and the beginning of well, the... No, that had ended a long time before that, Dave. A long time before. I, I was only into that for like a few months. I would read like I read everything, you know, and I would read that side of things. And uh, the Theosophical Society was fascinating because there were so many poets in there that I admired, you know. Um, so I was interested and I've always been a keen observer of, 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 of the times. And um, it was a, a very important that one understood what one didn't want as much as it was as important to find out what one did want. You know, I totally can relate. When I was in my 20s, I actually went to the Theosophical Society in uh, in Soho in Manhattan uh, just to sort of scope it out, and it didn't yeah. it didn't strike me as anything super dark, you know. And I was trying to read between the lines when I was there, um, and I also read that Crowley book, Diary of a Drug Fiend. Did you read that book? Of course. And I, I just it was such a such a fascinating take. Uh, on uh, on drug addiction, and it was written in 1920 or something, 1929 yeah, maybe. Marseille, it was all the whole scene in Marseille, you know, which was the drug center of the world because it was a port, and that's where all the drugs got into Europe. Right, and then that 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 place in Italy, right, uh, the Thelemic Temple, right. Yeah, you know, um, the Thelemic Temple, I can't remember where he built that, where, the, the little place where the real shit went down, um, Thelema, I think it was in Greece, right. and uh, he built this commune, and it just was disgusting, if you read about it, it's just horrific, and he'd gone mad by then. You know, what you've got to remember, and I think this is key, and we can get off this subject because it's a horrible subject, and I don't want to influence any young people to even begin to explore it. Um, he died alone in a boarding house in Hastings in the south of England, living on boiled eggs and heroin. How heroic is that? Right, right. I mean, just alone, period, and boiled eggs just disgust me. So the combination is just awful. Dig um, it. And, uh, and, and whenever I mention you to, uh, to my friends in the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. they always bring up your lovely uh, wife or your ex-wife, Miss Pamela. 
Yeah. And I heard an amazing quote from you, which was, when you saw her, you saw America. And when you married her, you married America. That's right. And, and what does that exactly mean to you? Well, when we did, I met her on a movie set and, and, um, in New York. It was a Warhol movie, and Keith Moon had been cast to play this rock star. Keith had jumped out a window or whatever, so they'd look looking for somebody else. I was in New York with Silverhead, my first man. This is 73, maybe 74, 1974. And I did the movie. I walked on the set. I saw from behind this woman in a Betty Grable 40s swimsuit and she looked over her left uh, shoulder and I had been married a few weeks to somebody else. Hmm. And I, I was 20, you know, whatever it was. And I look, and I thought that it, this, you know, Betty Grable, that whole notion of the 40s, of watching those movies as a child, and then Elvis in the 50s, America became so important to me in England, and, and all my contemporaries, same thing. Coca-Cola, the United States, Walt Disney, Mickey Mouse, Elvis, Marilyn, Betty Grable, Ava Gardner, Humphrey Bogart. That's it. This is America. And I thought, my God, that's America. And I then subsequently fell in love, and, and um, we got married. <laughs> you know, And I felt that I was marrying this country, and I still feel that way. Right, and, and when I I've hear you... I've lived here ever since, by the way. I've lived here ever since, since 1974. So way, way more than half of my life I've lived in America. Right, and there's a reason for that, obviously. And, uh, and Miss Pamela's claim to fame was obviously being a member of the GTOs, and she wrote a bunch of books, and she was kind of a famous uh, band supporter, we'll say. Um, well, she was, uh, you know, GTOs, Girls Together Outrageously. It was a band on Frank Zappa's label, Bizarre Records. Frank produced a record called Permanent Damage with the GTOs. The GTOs were created because the, the culture needed it. The bands, the young guys from England, Robert Plant, Jimmy Bates, late teens. Let's not forget how old Robert Plant was when he came to America. 19. Right. Okay. Just think about that for a second. And you've got all those young women that are absolutely, completely recreating the notion of what a fan is, of what a lover of music is, that the, the, the culture is free love, the culture is sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And they deeply believed in all of those things. And it was a major feministic um, revolution. Women empowerment. I got and, indeed, and to this day, after having been, you know, I'm with the band is now in the top ten of rock and roll books of all time. That is, it's sold millions of copies. Why? Because young women want to be validated. Absolutely. You know, if they dig something, they're going to go for it. If they want to fuck Mick Jagger, they'll fuck Mick Jagger. If they want to fuck Eddie Vedder, they'll attempt to do that and probably won't be successful since he just married a young model. But so the, the <laughs> whole notion of feminism is began there. Absolutely. On, and, and, on a rock and roll level. <laughs> and, you know, she continues now. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I can't tell you that, but there is a particular cable company that is interested in doing it with the band as a, a series on television. She teaches um, writing classes all over the world. Well, she'll go to Australia. She'll go to you know all around America for sure. And twenty uh, young women turn up, and um, she teaches them how she to, wrote. She's written five books all of which have been tremendously successful. And, you know, it's an amazing story. It really is. It's a great story of positive uh, revolutionary acts. I had, I had reached out to her. I had heard her on a podcast, and I had reached out to her about coming on Dopey, not knowing what her background in terms of addiction and drugs and stuff was. Yeah, no, no drugs at all. So you were married to her when you got clean, um, yeah. Was her not as an addict influential in you finding sobriety? Um, once I came out of the shadows, I, I then I realized what I had. But I, how, you can't realize the goodness when you're living in the badness. Totally. You can't see it. You can't see the forest from the trees kind of thing. Yes, precisely. When your soul... On waking up after three days of being, um, you know, uh, <laughs> on it, uh, you you want to find it again. So there's no room for love. 
No, because you're you're in the darkness. I understand completely. Um, you are a beautiful man, spiritually, physically. I really appreciate you coming on. I'm a huge fan of your boss as well, little Steven. And today's his birthday. So it is indeed. He's flying back from uh, Doha in the Middle East, and um, he's uh, we're going to honor him tomorrow night at the Hard Rock Hotel. Are you guys out there, come and see um, Stevie and uh, Sasa Johnny and the Azri Dukes are going to play. It's his birthday today. Please wish him a happy birthday on Twitter. He is my mentor. He is the most extraordinary man I ever met. He's responsible for my uh, radio career, my broadcasting career. And he is an incredible musician, writer. His album, Summer of Sorcery, is the best album of the year. And fuck the Grammys. Wait, can we talk about this for a second? Little, how did you, how did you get into Little Steven's uh, orbit? Check it pass open for him in the 80s. And, uh, for the East Street fan? Uh, no, 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 no. The Disciples of Soul. Ah. This is post, uh, post E Street. Before he went back, he did five albums, solo albums. And one of the Men Without Women, Check It Pass, supported him. And that's where we met. That's so cool. And, and why, I mean, I know this is a very vague and, you know, all consuming question. What makes him the mm-hmm. most extraordinary soul you've ever met? That's a really crazy thing to say. Because he has this absolute knowledge of what he, he, why he's on the planet. And that would be, all of the things he's done, tshrop.org is um, the most amazing vibe because what it is, it's teaching teachers how to teach music to kids. So hypothetically, you're talking about Sam Cooke, that goes to civil rights, that goes to, you know, why Sam Cooke was assassinated, if he was assassinated, who did it and why. Right. Young young African-American with a, a record company and a publishing deal in the 60s. Uh, oh, yeah, I don't think so, you know. So it, it just, he is absolutely, lives a life of, 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 redeeming the idea of rock and soul music as a force. That is, teachers teaching it is a great way of of explaining the history of our country and indeed the world, and also getting instruments into schools, which he does with Little Kids Rock. Now, why I really, really think he's probably the most extraordinary person I ever met is because he lives and breathes this. This is called service. He's being of service to the universe. So many people are in this game to take everything they can out of your pocket, you know. And the majority of people that one meets are desperate, ambitious, or he is none of those things, you know. He just makes his music, writes his music, goes out with the bus every now and then, and um, runs this incredible maximum rock and soul radio program called Little Stevens Underground Garage, Channel 21, Sirius XM. I love... So he's got a mission, and anybody with a mission is my kind of guy. I love this. I love this. I love Little Steven, and I love the Underground Garage, and I love rock and soul. That's my favorite shit. Um, yeah. And I wonder... You know, you talk. I heard you talk about the future of music and all this machine music and whatever. You know, yeah, I don't mind that. I like it. You know, I like it when there's soul. You know, as long as the soul I is like present. I like it if it's true. I like it if it's true. If they mean it, but I, you know, I, I will love it. it. It's got nothing to do with guitars or, or you know, Moogs or drum machines. If it's, if it, Billie Eilish, seventeen years old, amazing. You know, I, I you know, I can still listen to Sonny Boy Williams. You can do whatever you want. There's no prejudice. If it's good and it means and it emotionally connects with you, I don't care if somebody's, you know, playing a harp and singing, you know, ballads. It doesn't matter. Or Otis Redding, I, it's all beautiful if it if it if it's true. I hear you, Michael. I think uh, I really, really appreciate you taking the time with us. Uh, you're a beautiful soul, and thank you so much for coming on. I really do. It's my pleasure, David, and the best of luck to you and your family, and, and all of you out there, I love you. And, um, listen to our radio programs. Yes, Little Steven Underground Garage, uh, num- Channel 21, and when can they hear Michael Daybar? 8 to 11 Eastern every day and 9 p.m. to midnight on the West Coast. And is it true you're going on tour in Japan with the mistakes? I am at the end, at the beginning of February, and then Russia, and um, and then the UK. Amazing! You're going to bring it back here or no? 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, we have this song, uh, Crackling Hiss, out right now, which you can get at my website, michaeldebar.com. And I'm on Wicked Cool Records, Stevie's label. And I've just been nominated for the best cover of the year by the Independent Music Awards. I did a cover of the Supremes classic, Stop, in the name of love, but I do it at 100 miles an hour. And um, they're nominating it for the best cover of the year. So I'm sitting pretty. I mean, it's, it's been, since, you know, I've been at it since 72, playing rock and roll music. Music and I will be 102 and still be playing rock and roll music. Super cool, Michael. Thank you so much, man. Let's. Um, I would love to stay in touch, and uh, and I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much, David. God right. bless. God bless. Bye. Bye. So that was the incredibly charming and sweet and well versed and prolific Michael Daybar, and um, my friend Ryan, longtime friend, almost 30 year friendship, which is crazy, right, Ryan? Yeah, that's right. Is on the phone. Ryan has a new podcast that is going to come out. It's called Real Music History. Ryan's been on Dopey a long time ago, and I build him as conspiracy theorist Ryan, so as not to <laughs> confuse you with graphic design Ryan. And um, welcome back to the show. Glad to be here, Dave. Thanks for having me on again. Can you believe the media juggernaut that Dopey has become? Oh, it's great. I, I love seeing where it's at. The Dopey Con looked amazing. Um, wish I could have been there. I will, But I am very proud of what you achieved and the Dopey Nation in general. Aren't you shocked? Shocked? Well, I always knew that, you know... You had this ability, you're a great host, and seeing you work on other shows, but it's, it's really amazing where it's come now. It's, uh, it's taken to the next level. Shocking to me. Anyway, the funniest thing to me about Ryan is that I turned, I, I'm very much, or at least partially responsible for turning Ryan from a normie into a horrible stoner. <laughs> that is true. It probably wouldn't have happened had we not been roommates 27 years ago at Ithaca College. Right? I didn't hear the beginning of that, Dave. I said it probably wouldn't have happened if we hadn't been roommates 27 years ago. Absolutely. That's right. I would never have started. Well, I don't know if I never would have, but I did start smoking or with you. It is good college. You, I prob- never tried it you probably would have. You, I mean, considering what I it, said. No. Continue, please. Um, I had the only thing I had done before then was I did try acid once. When did you try acid before that? I tried it in high school, but it didn't really work. But I was willing to try it. It was like not real acid, you mean? Right, it was not real acid. But I was always like against herb up and you know up until that point. And uh, yeah, but I would like a lot of people was disillusion that you know the lsd myth with the beatles and everything else and expanding creativity so i did try i had seen you know herb as something that dumbed you down and lsd is something that expanded your mind and then that totally did a did a 180 now, yes it totally did a 180 although i did watch you know ryan tripped a ton of acid with me and without me that summer uh, me and 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 Ryan was also uh, pretty close with Todd back then, and me it was me you and Todd that went to the meadow in Central Park that day, and we brought we bought those sheets of red sun acid right. You were with us that day. Yes, yeah, the pink sunshine. Yes. Yeah, and that dude. You, do you, what do you what do you remember about that? That's one of my favorite Dobie stories. Oh, I remember. Um, you know this uh, uh, guy. Uh, just went by the name of George, wore a cowboy hat, looked like a Carlos Santana. He looked exactly like Carlos Santana. Standing on a blanket with his family all around him. and But the meadow was, was a whole different era back then. It was really a massive open air uh, market slash concert slash sports. Uh, you know, everyone doing everything all over the place. And uh, it was very much like a rock festival atmosphere in the meadow. Yeah. Peaceful. And you remember uh, when we smoked the chocolate tie in the meadow? But it's a, the chocolate tie. You remember yeah. that? Yes. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, continue please. And uh yeah, I remember I don't I remember how we got into having the good connections in the meadow. I think you know you were more responsible for those good connections, but we eventually 
we you know linked into some of the best people in the meadow. It was quite a scene, and that guy George uh, had you know amazing stuff, and then that led to another character who we used to get herb from all the time down there. Yeah, Pete Knighty. But the 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 thing with with George and the acid is like what I remember is like. I didn't have particularly good connections. I was just a big mouth, you know what I mean? And I would wander around and talk to people looking for <laughs> drugs. And um, and somebody and we were looking for acid, and Todd wanted to get a bunch of acid, and you, we all wanted to get a bunch of acid because we knew the economics of acid as well as how much uh, we wanted to trip that summer. So we met George, and I was like, dude, you know, I was very skeptical, and I was like, dude, how do we know it's good? And he broke off like four hits for you and me, and Todd <laughs> didn't do it. And we took two hits each, and we wandered around, and that shit fucking destroyed our brains. And then we bought 200 hits off of him, and we got in the car, and it was the 4th of July. You remember? And we drove out of the city, and we were listening to Jimi Hendrix, Acts as Bold as Love, driving out. Do you remember this? Yes, I remember that. Yeah. What and, I wasn't sure was which day was the day where we ended up watching Purple Rain and Joe versus the Volcano. That was a different day. That was a rainy day when we were tripping rainy in Manhattan, and, and it was like a school break, and we came down to buy that bong and a bunch of butt, and we wound up tripping. <laughs> right? That's right. I don't I don't remember Purple Rain or Joe versus the Volcano at all, but I do remember we drove you, me, and Todd drove back, to Ithaca on the 4th of July through crazy traffic and and we decided to go to uh Bethel to 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 smoke pot out of our new tobacco master <laughs> bong with orange juice in it in the field at Bethel. I remember that. You remember that? Oh my god, I forgot those details. Yes. I I mean that was also like one of the the more open open eye visuals like cuz I remember I fell out of Todd's car at that gas station and my my hand hit the ground and the ground turned to paisleys you know um because we were, i mean that acid was very strong and um and we wound up at the at the field at bethel and every time a car came over the hill it would just light up the whole field you know and i would get i was so scared that like the cops were coming whatever and then i had my my also my gay tripper story where on the ride back i was convinced we were all homosexual because we would be packing each other big bong hits and it was all phallic and big bong stuff um but those were the days right crazy i remember we went into that restaurant somewhere near bethel and everyone was just like you guys are from outer space where are these guys from we were just like out of minds and everyone's like whoa and i remember and todd didn't trip todd just kept smoking to catch up remember like he like he probably he smoked like just the whole time anyway those were the days and and there was another character that we met at the meadow named uh his name i'll just say his name he's probably dead now he's got to be dead right I i was wondering about that but i was i didn't know but Yes. We're probably. talking about 27 years ago. I, I'm just going to say his first name. His name was Pete. And uh, he wore a Krishna tank top and wore short shorts every day. And he would go to the meadow with a pocket. He had white hair, uh, white little clumps of white fluffy hair on top of his head, glasses. Um, you he, know, pretty gentle, kind old man appearance in general. But he was like not like that. Man, right? He was not. He looked like kind of like a psychedelic Albert Einstein, New Yorker. He lived on the Upper West yeah. Side. He said he was growing weed in his apartment. I imagine like a super hoarder, fucking shithole of an apartment up there. And um, and I met him, <laughs> and he had the best bud ever. And he would wrap these two yes. gram nuggets in cellophane. And we'd buy them at the meadow until like Giuliani or, you know, until the meadow became That's less right. of an open air drug market. And, uh, and then he set up a system where you have to call him, you call him and then, oh man. Yeah, I, exactly. I, Giuliani came in, the meadow was shut down. You couldn't really go there anymore. All the open air stuff shifted into, that's also when the, 
Herb store shifted into more of the delivery services. Right. There were no more spots. And that's also because of the resurgence of New York, that rent became more expensive. And also there were crackdowns on this stuff. Both of those things eliminated herb spots and it eliminated the meadow as a spot to, to get bud. But uh, right. I think you I couldn't s- go see Pete there. No. And I think I still know his number by heart. I think it's built into my brain. <laughs> um, and, uh, and Pete was such a dick. He was such a snobbish New Yorker. And um, do his voice, Dave. Uh, he had this very highfalutin <laughs> voice. He'd be like, uh, "I'll tell you what. If you want to get some bud, you or if you want to meet me, make sure you wrap the exact amount of money in brown paper, and I will meet you at two p.m. on Eightieth Street and Broadway on the northwest corner." You know, and he had this weird sort of erudite Upper West Side Jew New Yorker accent. Um, that's pretty decent, right? That sounds kind of like him, right? Right. Yeah. Yes, it's great. And um, so eventually, like, I had forgotten all about him, and then I ran out of Herb Connections, and his his number popped into my head. So I started getting Bud from him, and his Bud was always just amazing. And I started getting, like, large amounts of Bud for the people I worked with, and I would just keep the... And, I, and I, that's when I got a heroin habit. So I would start buying Bud for people I worked with, and then just... This is also butt. when Dave was making a TV show, and I was working with Dave on the show. Exactly. So uh, that that comes into play later with the equipment, the TV show equipment. But yes, Dave was making a TV show, music magazine style show, and uh, that's where also the changeover into using heroin happened as well. But, yeah. Uh, yes. So so at that point, Ryan was kind of staying. I don't think I, I think Ryan was staying in my apartment a little bit and nearby. And, um, and, uh, I, I was like, I, I, I didn't have any money and, uh, and I needed to get Bud and I didn't want to rip off Pete Knighty because I just didn't, I just didn't want to lose the connection. And I decided that Ryan. Right. So be, Dave comes up with the plan. This is a terrible plan in retrospect. With the plan, which is to sacrifice me, to burn me uh, any connections I might have with Pete to save his connections. So I was going to be the uh, the patsy. <laughs> this is <laughs> terrible. I see why you. I see why you didn't want to tell this story. Now I'm, I'm really not a nice person in this story, and you're the patsy. This is terrible. But okay, now tell the story. Let's go. So Dave comes up with the old school plan of we are going to take newspaper that looks exactly like an amount of, I believe, $500, and we're going to wrap it up in the brown paper, and we're going to put it in the bag. And I am, and because Pete never checks the money when you hand, it's a street handoff, so I'm going to go hand off the newspaper to Pete and get the bud. It was 500 <laughs> bucks? doing. I think so. I remember it being 200, but damn, that's not good. What a terrible story. Maybe it was. Anyway, still, either way, it's not good. Continue. But please. also, it's super. The, the, the herb, I remember the herb being very expensive. So it, I think 500 bucks even it wasn't like a lot of herb. Still a small bag of herb, you know, the brown bag that it got was still small. But anyway, I think it was that. So we go, to, we, we cut up the paper, we put it in the bag. <laughs> We've never done anything like this before. Um, actually, the only time anything like that ever happened to us was we actually got that done to us. When was that? Remember that video, that video camera that we got scammed on? Uh, there was like a really great street thief that busted out of, uh, that was like a Macy's or something. And he was holding his video cameras before we worked on the TV show. He was holding this box of a video camera. And he's like, yo, yo, I got this video camera. Uh, 150 bucks, 150 bucks. And me and you were like, oh, shit. And we pulled out all the money we had, which was like just about that or something. And we gave him the money. And he gave us the box of the video camera. And we walked away. And there was just like a bunch of like paper and shit in that box. Yeah. You know? Terrible. You remember that? I don't remember, but I don't. I don't remember much. I only remember the acid story in Woodstock. But continue. So whether that was the inspiration or not, we did get taken by that type of scam once. But anyway, so then we flipped the scam around and we ran it on Pete Knighty. I went and met him uptown, did the exchange, and it worked perfectly. 
it worked perfectly. Um, I don't know if you remember more details of me coming back with the herb or anything, but I do remember going up there, meeting him on the street at night. Um, you know, he was on the corner doing the handoff and the path and everything went fine. And I do remember coming back, but I don't remember a lot of the celebration part of it. Well, there was, there's probably no celebration because it was probably you coming back to my apartment where me and Todd were high on heroin. And if I didn't make this clear, Pete Knighty's system was he would walk around the Upper West Side picking up money wrapped in brown paper and giving back weed wrapped in brown paper. And, um, and yeah. every time I would go meet him, he would yell at me for something. Like maybe it wasn't brown enough paper or maybe it was white paper or maybe it was blue <laughs> right. paper. He would always yell at me about something. And even though Pete Knighty was a total asshole, uh, we didn't rob him because he was an asshole. We robbed him because we were drug addicts, me and Todd. And Ryan, we, you know, Ryan just right. wanted to get free bud. And, and we were, none of us were in our most moral upstanding place. And I want to tell the universe from the bottom of my heart, and I'll apologize for you and Todd also, and Pete, I'm sorry that this happened. I should find Pete Knighty and give him some <laughs> fucking money. But anyway, so Ryan came back with a bag full of weed. Which we smoked probably unceremoniously because we were fucking piece of shit drug addicts. You know what I mean? Like me and Todd were a total, we were not fun to be around at that point. Yeah, you were probably going to, you know, make, it probably wasn't you know, all for us at all. You were probably making some money off it just to survive or whatever and you know, support the other side of things. But either way, it wasn't a big celebration or anything. So, and it didn't, you know, change any of our situations financially or otherwise but then basically where it led to was a few weeks i guess after that um i was leaving the we from working leaving the studio and i had all of our uh tv production uh gear on me i had the uh the bag with our camera which was worth like five thousand dollars and i had i think a boom microphone stand i was holding in my hand and i was standing on the subway coming back down to Dave's apartment. Well, the irony also is we were recording a segment called uh, The History of Drugs was was the irony. Ryan was coming back to my apartment to record this episode we were doing on the history of drugs where it was like, you know, how popular drug consumption... It was a two-part documentary. Mm-hmm. I think we... we I, I, and And my favorite part was that all of the drugs we used, we actually had. Like I had pills and coke and ecstasy and heroin and weed to, to shoot for the TV show in my apartment. Remember that, right? You remember yeah. that? And 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 like and he came back yeah. with all this gear to to shoot, you know, some segments in the apartment. I, I don't remember what we were shooting. I think we were shooting some drugs. And we were just, you know, finishing it off. And Ryan was taking, I think, the one train back, right? Right. And and so, like, tell the story. This is the so standing there, and you know, and the standing the subway is pretty crowded. And I'm holding all of this gear, and all my hands are filled. And there, and this, and there is Pete Knighty, standing in the middle of the train, looking down, reading a little book, and he looks up. <laughs> and he just goes, you, and then every he, everything goes slow motion. He drops the book. His hands come out. He starts <laughs> lunging towards me to attack. And as he comes to attack, and he's coming right at me, and uh, like I said, there was probably like 20, 30 people around. It was pretty packed. And he's, uh, he lunges, and then uh, there's happened to be a police officer who, before he could really get on top of me, who gripped gripped him up, and it, it all happened at the in the same time. The, it was a stop, so the subway stopped. The doors opened. The cop came in, gripped Pete Knighty up, threw him off the train, and then there was some other officers out there. They all were on him right away, and people were right away shouting, yeah, he attacked him. That old man attacked that guy. That old man attacked him. He was out of nowhere. Blah, 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 blah. And then the doors closed, and I would back off. And we were back on my way, and I, and I was just like, "What just happened?" So not only, you know, and yeah, you know, it was just like 
to go from a, being attacked by him, his eyes crazed, coming at me, to him gripped up within seconds like a whirlwind, and I didn't even physically do anything. Yeah, and it was so weird because Knighty was never in that area. He was never around that area, let alone being on the train or ever seeing him somewhere like that. Crazy. So, uh, the other thing is that crazy. the next week I, I went back and I saw him again. And he went back and did yes. And I saw him again and he was like he was he and he accused me of being part of it. And I and I swore up and down that I didn't know what he was talking about. And that's just like the kind of thing that I think a heroin addict can lie about, you know? And like I do feel I mean, I didn't remember, you know. I mean, I remember the gist of the story because, like, what are the odds of you running into Pete Knighty? Pete Knighty was such a character. Um, I just said his last name like ten times, but he was. <laughs> it's probably not a real name. He was just such a character, and you know, I feel bad. So I just want to tell the universe I'm sorry. Ryan, are you sorry to, to Mr. Pete too? I am. Yes. Do you feel bad? Is that why you didn't want to guy. tell the story? Well, yeah. It's just. Uh... I don't know. It's just, uh, I don't mind telling it. It's good to go back and think about it again, I guess. It's a fucked up story. Anyway, that's... And, it's and, also like, you know, if you do something, it, it things come back, and they come back quicker than you realize, and you know, think you can, uh, you know, we'll just do this thing, and it'll, no one will ever know. Well, you know, it's just a matter of days before, even in New York with millions of people, the guy's right there next to you being like, you. Right, <laughs> you know? right. And that's not you even, that's hide. only a fraction yeah. of the karmic recompense we've paid since then, you know. There've been right. enough. There's been yes. enough shitty deals and terrible things, but that doesn't justify what happened to poor Pete. So I apologize, Pete. I'm gonna I, I'm gonna try calling him up. I think I know his number. When I get off the phone with you, I think I'm gonna call him up. I, you think it was five hundred well, bucks? Let me know how that goes, man. Do you think if it was? It, do you think it was? Do you imagine if it's still the same? Yeah, I could. That guy probably has been in the same place since like 1964. He, is he, he'd probably be like, I guess, 90 now, dude. He'd be in his 90s, yes. Totally. But he was like an Ayurvedic dude. He would like eat gluten-free bread before it was cool. He was pretty healthy, yeah. Yeah, he was super healthy. Now, Ryan, your show, which is it's not up yet, but it will be up soon, is called Real Music History. And what is the inspiration for this show? Uh, the inspiration is two things. Half of it is telling the story of uh, underappreciated and unsung musicians, artists, and creators behind the scenes of uh, of music in general. Um, a lot of you know, like uh, the studio groups, the Funk Brothers, Muscle Shoals, etc. People that p- people don't know who recorded all these songs. And then the other half is kind of more of the conspiratorial side of uh, music history, some of the business and uh, shady aspects that don't get talked about as much that uh, influenced history more than we realize. So it's kind of a conspiracy meets appreciation uh, show. Well, I, I, I really look forward to it, and I look forward to, uh, to coming on it as well. Uh, I, I want to put my two cents in, and I want to give a little preview, nothing crazy, just a tiny preview of uh, of the first episode, which is all about uh, Jimi Hendrix. And I think the day, in my imagination, with the Pete story, is that you were wearing your purple tie-dye Jimi Hendrix shirt on that day. Possible? <laughs> <laughs> that is quite possible, and I had forgotten about that shirt. Oh, yeah. Um, now, uh, so why don't you break down a little bit of the uh, Jimi Hendrix conspiracy Microsoft story? Sure. The first episode is uh, Jimi Hendrix, Rock Prophecy, Jesus Saves, and Microsoft. And uh, it basically is an investigation into a couple things. One thing is the origin of the song Purple Haze, and basically was it inspired by LSD, and was LSD as big of an early influence on Hendrix as is assumed? And it looks like it's not. It's not uh, uh, LSD-inspired. But uh, that's where this kind of started, and it led to the discovery of what's known as the Rock Prophecy, which comes uh, from the biggest Hendrix historian, Michael Fairchild, 
who basically discovered that Jimmy, at the end of his life, was writing a movie called Moon Dust that contained a prophecy of an asteroid colliding with Earth in the future, causing a great kind of Earth change and culture change, and that this asteroid would be named Electric Love. Um, this leads to Jimmy's legacy being taken over and co-opted by Microsoft, Microsoft founder Bill uh, Paul Allen, who uh, creates the Jimi Hendrix Museum. and uh, Which seems like a good uh, thing that Paul Allen was this, you know, very, very wealthy entrepreneur from Microsoft that uh, had the ability to give $5 million to Jimi Hendrix's dad and to create the Jimi Hendrix Museum. It sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? It does sound like a good thing. Um, However, uh, what really happened was kind of a suppression, at least, you know, according to Michael Fairchild, a suppression of the real ideas Hendrix was talking about. And uh, now uh, there's kind of a very strange co-opting of the whole asteroid prophecy um, through Microsoft and uh, the Microsoft media networks, MSNBC and DreamWorks Pictures, that kind of created this whole asteroid end of the world scenario through the movies Deep Impact, Armageddon, Etc. Let me ask so you something, now, though. Do you think that Jimi Hendrix, because I'm a huge Jimi Hendrix fan, and like maybe I wasn't reading between the lines enough, but I, I mean, as much as, uh, you know, uh, ridiculously, um, unbelievably, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just uh, pro- 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 prodigious guitar player he was, um, and what a, an amazing songwriter he was, and, and how good the music is. I never saw him as a christ-like prophetic character right um well he's and i said uh his version of you know his version he's not a traditional uh christian follower um but he has he talks about jesus a lot and the main uh where i bring up the jesus saves is that purple haze was originally called jesus saves it was a 10 to 15 minute long song that was about uh, based off of a science fiction story Jimmy read where he, that actually contained the words of the purple haze coming down around the earth. And in this original song, Jimmy was trapped underground and saved by Jesus. Was Jesus also actually very- underground or was it just more of like a, he found the Bible kind of thing? Uh, no, it was more like a, an appearance of Jesus. Or it wasn't like a, just like the, it wasn't that the idea of Jesus saved him. It was in this dream. Jesus was like a character. All right. So, but, um, so basically, what you're saying is that Mike. Right. I don't. I don't, I don't see. I don't. He was. Uh, you know, Michael Fairchild classifies him more as a seer, someone who could kind of see things happening out in the universe um, in visions, and then was trying to communicate them. Now, granted, Fairchild could be taking this to the next level of a prophecy level. But Jimmy did talk about these things, and now these things are happening in current events. So So that's where it does become almost either Microsoft and the elite are kind of helping to fulfill these things, or they're taking these ideas and using them, or there is something to it. You know, I haven't made all my conclusions yet, but what I can say now what it what it leads to of jimmy saying that this asteroid was going to hit in about 30 years it would be discovered he said well 30 years later they discovered a giant asteroid that could potentially collide with earth in the next you know 10 to 14 years from now so And and they actually named it eros correct which means love yeah, there were two uh, two asteroids. The main, the first one uh, that is not set to collide with Earth is Eros, which is love. And Hendrix named his electric love. And on the day that NASA landed on Eros, the first time NASA landed an object on an asteroid, was the day that Microsoft announced their new operating system, which was called XP, which they said was inspired by Jimi Hendrix's experience. And they, they, they had that party at the Jimi Hendrix Museum, and the XP Experience operating system was codenamed Asteroid 
while they were working on it. But it's possible that these nerds just liked playing asteroids and listened to fucking Axis Bold as Love or some shit, right? I mean, these well, I mean, these Paul can... Allen owns Hendrix's Woodstock Strat. I mean, he is he he has you know he owns everything possible about Hendrix that you can imagine. Well, this is a very, 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 very controversial and interesting possible conspiracy. And these yes. and more conspiracies like that will be totally available for you guys to check out on Ryan's upcoming podcast and website, Real Music History. And I look forward to you coming on the show and doing some music stuff as well, because Dave is an excellent music journalist, um, which I look forward to doing, hearing more stuff from you on all that. Were you around? You were you show on TV. Were you around when uh, when I did the Buddy Miles interview? No, I would love to see that. I interviewed Buddy Miles um, back in those days. For you know, Shuffle or Dopey? For Shuffle. I think is he still alive? I think so. Yeah. I, I don't. I don't. I, I'm surprised I never told you about it. I interviewed Buddy Miles, and I was well uh, on heroin. You know, I was deep right. in my heroin addiction, and I think he was too. And um, and me and him were just sitting there. I mean, I don't know that he was on heroin, but I do know that he seemed all kinds of fucked up. And we just sat there kind of nodding out, mumbling at each other. And I said, did you know that Jimi Hendrix prophesized the electric love asteroid? And he said, it's the truth. And, uh, and that was that. You know, it was <laughs> fascinating. But, uh, Rye, I love you. I love to have you on the show. And um, Dopey Nation, if, if you're able to find, if you can, I'm just going to say it, Dopey Nation, if you're able to find anywhere on the internet or in the world, Dave's old show, episodes of him doing Shuffle, I suggest finding them because they're excellent. They don't, there's only one that's available. And you never know. They could be out there, man. They could be out there somewhere. Wow, that's true. You never know. But for now, we'll just say thank you, Ryan. Stay strong, Dopey Nation. And fucking toodles Stay for, strong, Dopey Nation. And toodles for, for Chris and for Todd and for everybody out there who's, who's struggling, right? Yes, toodles for Chris and Todd. All right, right on. Thanks, Ryan. Bye, Dave. Bye bye. One, two,
Thank you, everybody. So, you don't have a name for our band. Thank you very much.